Okay, here we go. Welcome everybody. Thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, I'm Jenny Jasinski with Pink Lemonade Project. And tonight we have uh, Katrine Fink who's joining us. Um, Katrine is a Mayo Clinic certified wellness coach and a national board certified health and wellness coach. She herself is a breast cancer survivor and passionate about empowering and supporting cancer survivors as they heal and navigate their new life. And so we'll let her get started with her presentation on stress reduction, which this is a little bit of a stressful situation. So we'll take some of those tips. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Katrine. Yeah. Thank you, Jenny. And thanks all for those of you who were able to make it. Uh, I appreciate you being here and going through the trouble and figuring it out to get here. So thank you. Um, before I pull up my, my um, PowerPoint, I'm going to invite you, if you have a journal or a notebook or some paper nearby, um, to have that close to you. I we're going to talk about five different self-care practices. And at the end of each section, I'm going to ask you a couple of reflective questions. And you might want to take a minute to sit with those questions. I'll give you a minute or two um, to think about those. And also, if you have questions that come up while I'm sharing information, just jot those down. And that way, you'll remember them at the end. Um, so let me see if I can pull this up. Let's see. And you all see that? Yes. yes. Okay. And Jenny, do you mind just managing the chat um, yes. for me and letting me know if somebody um, has anything to share? Because I will throw out a couple of questions for people to share as well. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Chat loaded. Okay. Okay. So... This evening was kind of very typical of times when I give this presentation. It seems like my life gets really crazy right before. So I get to practice everything I'm teaching, which is kind of the way life is, right? We're always learning. We're always growing. Um, life is a journey and not a destination. So um, I got to use these factors quite a bit in the last weeks. Um, I'm going to just move these little pictures. Okay. So stress is a daily challenge for all of us. Um, we're going to talk briefly about stress and how it impacts us. And there, then we're going to take a look at five practical self-care habits, including mindfulness, social support, movement, boundaries, and sleep. And look at how each one of them nourish us reduce our stress and support us in navigating the ups and downs of life. So there are two types of stress. One is acute stress and the other is chronic stress. Acute stress is situational and short-term. It's a valuable resource of the body that gives us energy and focus to handle a task. So we, we were designed to be able to handle acute stress and um, the body after the stress response knows how to balance itself out again. Chronic stress or long-term stress though is a situation where either we are under stress for a long time or we have many stressors coming at us and the body and the mind don't really have time to recover and to reset themselves. And that's where the danger lies. And this is what, something we want to avoid. Chronic stress suppresses our immune system. It also leads to chronic inflammation, which increases the risk of developing disease. And here are some of the diseases that are linked to chronic stress, and I'm sure that there are more. So uh, heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, muscle pain, depression, mental illness, cancer, and many other illnesses. An important key to reducing and managing stress is becoming more self-aware of our internal environment, really where our nervous system is at, and what behaviors or lifestyle choices contribute to our stress levels. So what I'm gonna do is 
invite you just to share in the chat um, just behaviors or lifestyle choices that you know that increase stress. An example might be just having too much on our plate. So what are the working without taking a break? Yes, thanks, Colleen. What else increases our stress in terms of our behaviors or lifestyle choices? What about expectations? Yes. Absolutely, expectations, having expectations can increase. Yeah. Someone else says day-to-day uh, -day interactions with difficult people at work. Yep. Another one says scheduling things back-to-back -back without time to recover. Right. So I'm going to just add a few. So not having good boundaries, right? Being self-critical. It's one of our biggest stressors, our inner critic. Not having enough support or asking for enough support. Technology overload, right? Do you look at your emails before you get out of bed? That can be a big stressor. And also not making enough time to play and to create pleasure in our lives, right? As adults, we often become too serious about life and we forget to create intentional time every day to relax, to play, and to have fun. So these are just common lifestyle and behavior stresses, stressors that are in our culture. So I wanna to touch briefly on how our brain works because understanding this will also help us in managing stress. So our brain has two settings. It can either be in focused mode, which is when we're thinking purposeful thoughts, like watching a sunrise, playing with our children, um, communicating with a friend. So we are outward focused and our, our brain is working in a purposeful way. The other mode is the default mode or the autopilot mode of brain, which is also called wandering mind. And we spend up to about 50% of our day in default mode or wandering mind mode. And the challenge is that our brain also has a negativity bias and it's wired to overfocus on our own flaws, on others' flaws threats and fear, it's part of the survival mechanism that our brain has. So therefore, often when we're in default mode, we're caught up in our heads thinking negative or random thoughts, which causes stress, anxiety, and depression. So what can we do about that? So one of the things we can do is start becoming more self-aware about what am I feeling right now? Now, sometimes if I'm feeling down or if I'm feeling anxious or stressed or angry, I can ask myself, what am I thinking right now that's causing this? And is it really true what I'm thinking or am I worried about something that really doesn't exist? So as we start to become more self-aware about our feelings, we can also start to redirect our thoughts. There's a great saying where your attention goes, your energy flows. So we all have, always have a choice to manage our, our thoughts and our awareness. Someone has their hand raised, so I think someone okay. has a question or a comment. Monica, okay. is that you? Did you have a question? Your hand is raised. Um, okay. Is everything I okay? In, I think it's an accident, okay. 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 Sorry. That's all right. So we're going to look at mindfulness as our first self-care practice. Uh, mindfulness is a practice that we can develop, which helps us manage our thoughts and bring our attention back to the present moment. It can help strengthen the focus mode of the brain. And mindfulness is being present 
and fully aware of what we are thinking, feeling, and sensing without interpretation or judgment, just being, being with what is, whether it's comfortable or not, right? So mindfulness really empowers us to live in tune with ourselves. Mindfulness practices are a training for the mind, just as going to the gym is a training for the body. The more we do it, the easier it becomes to learn to refocus our attention in the present when we get caught up in worry or anxiety or fears. So here are some common mindfulness practices. Deep, slow breathing. So breath, you always have access to breath wherever you are. And I use this one a lot. So when you want to calm yourself down, if you're anxious or stressed and you notice that, a great thing to do is just to bring your attention onto your breath and to slow your breathing down and to really focus on your out breath, especially all the way to the very end. What it does is it starts to change brainwave function and it also quiets and calms the nervous system. And it's great because you can slow your breathing down and pay attention to breath anywhere, anytime. Relaxation practices such as body scans or progressive relaxation. And we'll do this um, in a moment. And this is something that is great to do, especially at the end of the day when you just wanna relax your body and quiet your mind. Walking meditation. So walking meditation is about walking usually outside um, and just being very focused on what your senses are picking up. So listening to the sound of the birds or the cars, feeling the sun hitting your skin or the rain, feeling the pavement underneath your feet. Um, so you're very present to your senses rather than being lost in your, your head, um, worried about your day or planning your day. So it's a very present focused walking meditation. Yoga, Tai Chi, Qigong are called moving meditations. They also help create presence um, and they can be very calming and healing for the nervous system. Journaling, so it's a way of just writing out your thoughts and feelings and just kind of dumping them onto the page and processing them that way. And the last one I have here is meditation and I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. But I'm gonna have you, um, we're going to just practice a body scan because this is something you can also use all the time. And I love doing this, especially at the end of the day or even before I do a meditation, because it, it gets you out of your head and gets you back into your body. Kind of tune in and see what's going on with yourself, um, where you might be holding anything, where you might be feeling. A lot of times we tune out of our bodies. So this is a great practice to come back to our bodies and and be more present. So. I'm going to invite you to take a moment and just kind of close your eyes where you're at and just notice where you are, what you're feeling in this moment, what you're thinking, and just take a deep breath and let that go. And then I'm going to have you just kind of take a deep, another deep breath in and slowly exhale. I'm going to invite you just to notice your feet and how are your feet feeling right now? Are they holding any tension? Are they relaxed? Does one feel different than the other? Just take a breath and just let them relax and let go. Moving up to your knees. Notice your knees. How are they feeling in the moment? Are they tired? Do they feel comfortable? Just take a deep breath in and relax and let that go. Moving up to your thighs and to your hips. Do you notice any tension? Do, are there any feelings? Is one sore, is it not? Just take a deep breath in and release any tension that you might be holding there. Moving up to your back, your lower back. Just noticing what's there. Maybe it's comfortable, maybe it's tight. Just taking in a relaxing breath and releasing it back out. Moving up to your mid-back, your upper back. 
Maybe there's some tension from sitting at the computer today. Just take a deep breath into that area and just release it. Moving up to the shoulders, maybe rotating your shoulders, circulating them a little bit, just releasing whatever they might be holding. Moving up to the neck, noticing how it feels today. Just breathing, moving up to the jaw. Are you holding any tension from your day? Maybe you have to talk a lot, or maybe you hold, held stress there. Just take a, a relaxing breath out. And moving up to the top of your crown, the top of your head. And just letting go of any thought, any worries and concerns for the day. Taking one more deep breath in through your nose and breathing out through your mouth, feeling yourself present and relaxed in this moment. So that was a body scan. Um, I'm sure some of you have used this before and maybe others of you, that's a new, new um, practice, but it's, it's a really great way to kind of center yourself again. I want to talk for a minute about meditation. I know a lot of people say to me, I just can't get my mind to quiet down from meditation. And I just want to share some thoughts and insights into it. So meditation is a mindfulness practice. Significant research has been done on the benefits of meditation. Not only does it reduce stress in the moment, but it starts on a regular practice, with a regular practice, it starts to create a mental armor, protecting us from anxiety and stress. Regular meditation actually changes the brain tissue and the structure and the function of the brain. It thickens the tissue so that it actually it becomes more resilient to anxiety. And they've done research in the military where they had some of the um, military people do 12 minutes of meditation five days a week, and they noticed that that made a significant difference. So it doesn't take hours of meditating. It can even just be a few minutes every day. Some of the benefits of meditating are it strengthens focus, attention, and self-awareness. It improves memory and learning. It decreases emotional reactivity, stress, anxiety, and depression helps us stay calm and focused with challenges. And the more you practice, the more you benefit. Tara Brock is a well-known mindfulness and meditation teacher, and she has a, a website, um, and she has recorded guided meditations that you can listen to for free on her site. Um, she has some great tips for developing a meditation practice. She says, practice daily, even for a short time, even if it's just five minutes or more. The biggest reason people don't meditate is because they feel like they're not doing it right. So be willing to let go of that kind of self-judgment and just keep working at it. Posture, sometimes people think they have to sit cross-legged like a yogi. But you can sit, you can stand, you can walk in any way that promotes alertness, openness, and ease. Arriving in your body is important because it gets you out of your head and helps you relax. So doing a brief body scan like what we just did helps to kind of set up the nervous system and the mind and the body to, to get quiet. It's a great way to kind of let go and just be in the present. Create an anchor that you can return to if you become lost in thought. You will get lost in thought. Our minds wander. We talked about that earlier. So when you notice that your mind is wandering, you just bring it back to your anchor. Your anchor can be your breath if you're focusing on your breath. Or if you have your hands on your lap, your, your anchor can be your hands. Um, it can be music that you're playing to help you meditate. So having an anchor that you can return to is helpful. 
Keep returning to your to presence, so to the present moment. Your mind will wander. And deepen mindful presence with two questions. You now, sometimes when we get quiet, emotions come up. And emotions are kind of like waves. They won't stay forever. They will move through us, but we need to just allow them to do that. So sometimes when we get quiet, something might come up and ask yourself, what's happening inside me right now? And can I be with this? Practice kindness to yourself if difficult emotions arise. And sometimes just placing your hand over your heart and sending a message or, of care to any vulnerable place inside of you is helpful. So there are a variety of ways to practice meditation. You can use guided meditations. So Tara Brock has some wonderful ones on her website. You can Google um, guided meditations and find free ones. YouTube has free guided meditations. There's an app called Insight Timer. I believe they have free meditations. And UCLA Health, their website also has free meditations. Sometimes what helps me is to use music with headphones and play um, what's called binaural beats. And you can find that kind of music on a streaming app like Spotify. So listening to binaural beats, this kind of music, it changes brainwave function, it reduces anxiety, and it helps you reach a meditative state quicker than without it. So as a review, there are many ways to practice mindfulness. Some of the benefits include like less negative thinking, reduces anxiety and stress, it improves mood, lowers blood pressure, reduces chronic pain, and improves sleep. But here are some questions I'm gonna give you a minute or two to reflect on. How often do I take time to nourish myself with quietness, spiritual practice, and inner reflection? What practices do I have that allow my busy mind to get quiet? What practices am I curious about exploring? And how can I build at least five minutes of a mindfulness practice into every day? I'm just going to give you a minute to sit with these questions and just jot down any things that come to mind. You will get the PowerPoint as a handout um, or as a PDF file. So you'll be able to go back to these questions later on again. The next self-care practice is building positive connections with others. At a fundamental level, we humans need each other. While independence is important, it's just as important to remember that humans are social creatures and that we are designed to thrive in community. I love Brene Brown and she writes, connection is why we are here. It's what gives purpose and meaning to our lives and belonging is in our DNA. We are biologically, cognitively, physically and spiritually wired to love, to be loved and to belong. When those needs are not met, we don't function as we're meant to be. We break, we fall apart. People love you not despite your imperfections and vulnerability but because of your imperfections and vulnerability. So researchers have found that people with strong social connections live longer and recover better from illness and disease. What matters with respect to your health is not the size of your social circle, but the frequency of connection. So if you have two or three good friends or two or three people that you feel safe with, that you feel supported by, that's worth more than 2,000 Facebook friends, right? So 
it's it's really the frequency, the quality um, of connection versus the size of your social circle. So who is in your support network? Anyone who offers you support, guidance, love, or inspiration. Sometimes it's family and sometimes it's not, right? But our support network can include family if they are supportive. They can include our friends, pets, coworkers, clergy, healers, doctors, massage therapists, acupuncturists. So the people who are um, guiding you, supporting you, this is part of your support network. So it's really important to make sure that you feel safe um, and supported by them. And again, frequency, not size matters. So sometimes our support circles change after a diagnosis. People thought that we thought we could count on fall away. So it's also really important after a diagnosis to reach out and meet new people and find your new tribe if you're not getting the kind of support from people who've been in your lives. When we feel supported, loved, or comforted, our brain increases its output of dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins, which increase inflammation, it increases blood and oxygen circulation, increases our immune response, lowers our stress levels. And even connection with an animal or with animals can release healing hormones for us and for them. And studies have shown that pet owners actually live longer. So to deepen your social connections, make it a goal to have one meaningful interaction every day. So according to a relationship coach featured um, a while back on CBS Sunday morning, it takes time and effort to create connection. In fact, it takes about 50 hours to make an acquaintance, 90 hours for a good friend, and 200 hours to have a best friend. Here are some ways to strengthen your social support. So reach out to someone you love to deepen your connection with them. And I'm going to invite you right now on your paper just to jot down maybe somebody you haven't talked to in a while who's important to you or somebody you would like to reach out to. Sometimes we get so busy with life, we forget. So if there's somebody on your mind, I just invite you to write their name down so that you can reach out later on. Surround yourself with non-judgmental friends who allow you to express your feelings. That's an important one. Surround yourself with others who are hopeful and believe in your ability to heal. Get a four-legged friend or volunteer with animals. And get regular body work, massage, acupuncture, or healing energy sessions. They can be touches immensely healing, and it's wonderful for the nervous system in relaxing it and creating calm and peace. What speaks to you? Might What might you want to add into your life? So here are some ideas on joining groups with a common interest. Doing a physical activity, such as a gentle yoga class, a walking group. Tai Chi, belly dance, taking an art class, a language class, maybe joining a choir, practicing meditation in a group, joining a spiritual circle that is loving and supportive, or connecting with other types of support groups like Pink Lemonade Project. So again, here are a few questions to reflect on, and I'll give you a minute. So again, who can you re reconnect with today? What might be your next step in growing and deepening your social support? And what help or support do you need? Who could you reach out to to do this? So movement, 
Physical activity. Physical activity is one of the best things you can do for your health. Health benefits start immediately after exercising and even short periods, five minutes of exercise make a difference. Mental health benefits of physical activity. So it reduces stress and anxiety. It can also interrupt anxious thinking, gets us out of our heads, brings our, our awareness into the present. It can be a form of meditation. Like rock climbing can be a form of meditation because you better be in the present moment. <laughs> it improves our mood by releasing endorphins. And endorphins are feel-good neurotransmitters of the brain. And it creates the relaxation response in the body. Physical activity also improves our energy levels, cognitive function, lung and heart health, muscle strength and flexibility, and our sleep. Some of the physiological changes in cancer patients' bodies with exercise. Um, and actually, I want to say something here. So research, so it used to be that people believed that while you were being treated for cancer, you shouldn't be exercising. But they did a lot of research in the 1980s. And both the American Cancer Society as well as the National Cancer Institute now support and encourage exercise during cancer treatment. And what they found is that exercise actually significantly reduces the reoccurrence and the mortality rate from many cancers, including breast, colon, prostate, endometrial, ovarian, and lung cancers. And here are some changes that happen in cancer patients' bodies if they are uh, exercising even during treatment. Of course, it reduces body fat and it increases immune cell activity. It improves oxygen delivery and utilization lowers levels of insulin and estrogen, improves digestion, so it improves the gastrointestinal system, reduces inflammation, and that actually improves people's direct response to chemo and radiation. So exercise is one thing, and another thing to look at is how can we build more organic movement into our daily lives? How can we be more physically active? So here are some thoughts. Get up from your computer hourly. You know, sometimes we can get caught up in our work and setting a timer on our phone can be helpful for that. Maybe just get up and get a glass of water or walk around your house briefly. So move a little bit. Walk to your mailbox. Maybe doing some stretching or some moving or dancing even during TV commercials. Take a walk around the block. Park further away from store entrances. And I know the rainy season is coming, but you can still do this. You can still park a little bit further away and maybe use an umbrella or your hood and walk the entrance from the further, furthest part of the parking lot. Walk during lunch breaks. Take the stairs whenever possible. These are called, so yoga, tai chi, and qigong are mind-body exercises. They're also called moving meditation and moving medication because they the research shows that this kind of movement is so healing for, for the mind and the body. So yoga, tai chi, qigong all combine movement with focused attention and with breath. Yoga helps with sleep. It lowers stress levels, reduces anxiety and depression, reduces fatigue, decreases pain, helps with joint flexibility, range of motion, muscle strength, and postures. So numerous studies show that yoga has great healing benefits for many chronic illnesses, including cancer and autoimmune disorders. Tai Chi and Qigong come from Chinese martial arts and Chinese medicine. And there's growing evidence that Tai Chi and Qigong can be used to treat and prevent many health conditions, including cancer. So the research supports that Qigong and Tai Chi have positive effects on fatigue, immune, immune function, reduced inflammation, reducing stress, 
cognitive function, improved balance, pain reduction, and quality of life. Rebounding or jumping on a trampoline. So this can be fun. A rebounder is really a mini trampoline that you can have in your house. It's really close to the floor. Maybe it's a foot off, foot or two off the floor, probably not even two feet. Um, it can be done by anybody, even um, short, like just doing a minute or two if you're really fatigued. It has a lot of health benefits. So rebounding or jumping on a mini trampoline improves lymph flow. It improves blood oxygenation. It strengthens muscles and bones. It improves balance and coordination. It's good for cardiovascular strength. It's great for lowering stress levels. And it's easy and safe for patients with limited energy. Um, it's easy to put on a song that you love and just jump on the rebounder for two minutes. It's a great way to get a little bit more movement and fun into your life. So the physical activity guidelines for Americans, which includes also pe with people with chronic illnesses, um, they've developed a, an ideal comprehensive program. And this is what they recommend for all adults. So spending five minutes to 15 minutes a day of stretching and flexibility. So stretching improves range of motion, it reduces joint stiffness, and it promotes relaxation. It'll also help you sleep better if you can do it before you go to bed. Doing muscle strengthening exercises two to three days a week. So you can focus on all the muscle groups. You might want to use your own body weight, like push-ups or squats or bridges. You can use resistance bands, free weights, machines. Moderate cardiovascular activity. So they recommend about 150 minutes a week as a minimum. And that adds up to about 30 minutes, five days a week. That could be walking half an hour, five days a week. Maybe it's walking twice a day for 15 minutes or three times a day for 10 minutes. And again, this, these are goals to work towards. You know, not everybody is going to be ready to jump into this kind of a, a program, but this is an idea of maybe a goal to have. And then balance exercises. So especially as we age, we need to include balance exercises, even standing on one foot, maybe doing some yoga poses, things like that. So make a plan. How do we move forward? How do we create change? First thing is to reflect on where am I today? Where might I want to be in a month? And we want to take easy, doable steps to make change. Where do I want to be in a year? And how can I work towards this safely and realistically? So having a plan where you're writing this down will help you to move forward towards more movement, more physical activity in life. And what support might I need? Maybe a wellness coach, maybe a friend to walk with, or maybe I need a dog to help me walk more often or whatever the goal would be. So again, these are some questions to reflect on. You need to take some notes on. And again, you'll have this in your in your email. So boundaries, daring to set boundaries is about having the courage to love ourselves even when we risk disappointing others. It's Brene Brown. If you find yourself trying to be all things to all people, and feel that you are expected to hold everyone's life together, you may be suffering from not having clear boundaries. Some of the signs you might have a, have a problem setting and keeping boundaries is that you often go along with others' plans and ideas and say yes, even when you really don't want to. You feel like you're responsible for making others happy. 
You're often tired. You're giving all your energy away by constantly tending to the needs of others and putting your own needs on the back burner. It's hard for you to make decisions because you're always worried about what others want. And you're less sure of what you like or what matters to you because you spend most of your time trying to make others happy. Something to remember is that when we say yes to everything and everyone, we are also saying no to ourselves, to our own needs and to our own well-being. So boundaries are really about owning our own value. They're about self-care, self-respect, and protecting our energy. Why do you think it's hard to say no to others? I think sometimes it's hard to hear no, and we put ourselves in the position of the other person, and we think it's going to be hurtful if we say no to them or disappointing. We want to be liked and accepted. We were raised not to disagree with authority figures. We are afraid of hurting or disappointing others. We're trained by life to be people pleasers. Maybe as a child, we learned that this was a skill that got us what we needed and got us the love that we wanted. We feel guilt or shame when we say no. We don't want to create conflict. So these are some and there are more. So some of the cost of unhealthy boundaries include feeling burned out, feeling drained. Anger and resentment can creep up over time. Anxiety and depression builds. Sometimes we don't feel in control of our life when we can't say no. Our self-esteem plummets. And eventually illness and disease can surface. When we don't have healthy boundaries, we can feel intruded upon physically, emotionally, mentally, and psychologically. It's important to say no to commitments, to requests, or even to conversations that you don't want to have to avoid burnout and feeling drained. So here are some ways to say no that might feel more gentle than just straightforward no. No, thank you, but it sounds lovely. Unfortunately, I already have plans and those plans might just be with yourself. Sorry, but my plate is already full. Thank you for thinking of me. I wish I could, but I can't. I'm afraid I can't. Sadly, I have something else going on. I have another commitment. I'm honored you asked, but I can't. And sometimes just saying no is enough. No is a full sentence. You can always tell somebody you need to sleep on a decision before giving them an answer. That gives you time to build up courage and maybe the right response that feels good to you. Remember that your time and your energy are precious resources that you want to use wisely. So your boundaries have been crossed when you've been asked to behave in a way that does not support your physical, emotional, or mental well-being and is not in alignment with your personal values, standards, or intuition. You might feel a pit in your stomach, anxiety or tightness in your chest or throat. You might feel confused or irritable, anxious, resentful, surprised, or even angry. Here are some of the gifts of having healthy boundaries. It allows you to have energy, space, and time to heal and to flourish. It's about understanding your value and your priorities. Healthy boundaries give you the ability to express your needs clearly. 
and that allows you to express your thoughts and your feelings. The statement that you matter, not just others. It teaches others how to treat you, creates healthy relationships and builds trust. And that was it. So how do we strengthen our boundaries? So all personal growth starts with self-awareness. Take some time to reflect. So taking some time to reflect on our beliefs about boundaries can help us gain greater clarity. Clarity empowers us to make new choices again. So where did I learn that I can't draw healthy boundaries? Who modeled that for me? What is the story I'm telling myself about what would happen if I set clear boundaries? And am I worried that maintaining my boundaries says something negative about me? These are some really valuable questions to reflect on. So here are some tips for setting boundaries. Say no to what does not serve you. Be clear and stand your ground without guilt or shame. Be willing to accept the discomfort of saying no. It's always going to be uncomfortable to say no to somebody. Be prepared for others' reactions. Some people might be very supportive and other people might be irrit irritated or angry or sad. Acknowledge your courage and be kind to yourself. And setting boundaries takes practice. It's a skill to be developed and learned and practiced. If you allow your inner voice to take care of you, you begin to listen to yourself, your intuition, your gut feelings, your stress and your anxiety will go way down and your happiness factor and your well-being will go way up. Another tip is to use affirmations to help you remember it's okay to say no. Some affirmations might be, it's okay for me to ask for what I need, what I need matters, and I matter. Here are some journal questions to work with that will support you in setting healthy boundaries. So what boundaries do I need to expand or define in my life? What would life be like if I maintained these boundaries? How might it be different for me? Are there any challenges I need to work through to do so? Do I need to communicate with somebody about something? And what support or help might I might need? Do I need? Again, just take a minute to reflect on these. Just jot down any notes for yourself. So the last self-care practice I want to look at is setting ourselves up for restorative sleep. Most people need about seven to nine hours of sleep and some do well and feel good with six. Not getting enough sleep increases the amount of, of cortisol, which is a stress hormone in our system. Sleep's important for immune health. It allows the brain and body to recover at night. It supports our mood, cognitive function, and memory. It supports our immune function, our heart health, our blood sugar regulation, weight management, and other important functions of the body. A lack of sleep can activate anxiety, and like I mentioned before, increase cortisol. 
It can also increase depression and make somebody more susceptible to suicidal thoughts. So prolonged sleep deficiency can lead to chronic systemic low-grade inflammation and may be associated with some autoimmune diseases as well. And I know that um, sometimes when you're going through cancer treatment, sleep can be an issue and it's an important topic to talk to your physician about or maybe even to talk to a naturopathic oncologist about and they and give you some support, whether it's supplements or sleep medication to help you with this. We're gonna look at creating good sleep hygiene. And sleep hygiene includes both an optimal sleep environment as well as habits, good habits that influence the quality and the quantity of sleep we get on a regular basis. Um, one of the biggest habits that I notice in myself and with others is instant gratification, which is like watching a Netflix series and you just want to get one more episode in because it's just so addicting, right? So you want that instant gratification and then we don't get enough rest, right? So be aware of that. Um, it's a pretty big habit that can get in our way. Some sleep uh, supportive sleep habits include making sleep a healthcare priority. I think in our culture, in general, people undervalue sleep. Um, going to bed and waking up at the same time every day if possible, even on weekends, having a set time to go to bed and a set time to wake up helps the body regulate itself, and get into a natural sleep cycle. Getting natural daylight doses in the morning, even if it's rainy or cloudy outside, will help with your sleep that night. Avoiding alcohol at least two or more hours before bed. And avoiding caffeine in the afternoon and in the evening. And avoiding heavy, me heavy meals within two hours of going to bed. Something that can be helpful is to create a sleep log if you wanna observe what habits are getting in the way of good sleep and just noticing and writing down, what did I do today that either supported or um, stood in the way of getting good sleep. Have an optimal sleep environment. So keep the bedroom cool, at least 65 or even cooler will help you sleep. Do not eat, work, or watch TV in the bedroom. It can be stimulating, and also it starts to um, program the mind that this is an active place um, and not a restful place. Stop using electronics 30 to 60 minutes before bed. Use earplugs if you are sensitive to sounds, if your animals sleep in your room and they're scratching or moving around if your husband snores or your partner snores to so use earplugs and room darkening curtains and that's especially important in the summertime when the sun um, comes up so early using a white noise machine can actually reduce anxiety and if you can't fall asleep within 30 minutes get out of bed and go do something that's calming and quiet some additional thoughts are keeping clean pillows. So pillows you generally want to recycle after about six months due to allergens. Having a comfortable and supportive bed. Remember you spend about a third of your life in bed, so make sure it's comfortable and supportive to you. And keep your animals out of the bed. Sometimes they can be the reason we don't sleep well. Here are some foods that support sleep. So eating two kiwis one hour before bedtime. Kiwis have antioxidant properties that suppress inflammatory markers and are rich in serotonin. Tart cherries, so sour cherries, uh, Richmond, Montmorency, English Morello cherries. So cherries um, have average con have above average concentrations of melatonin, which is a hormone that helps regulate the circadian rhythm and promotes healthy sleep. Fatty fish like salmon. 
So fatty fish provides vitamin D and omega-3 fatty acids that release and regulate serotonin. Nuts. Nuts contain melatonin, omega-3s, and magnesium and zinc, which promote better sleep. Rice, about four hours before bedtime. Again, you don't want to eat too close to bedtime. A study of adults in Japan found that those who ate rice regularly slept better than those who ate more bread and noodles. Protein with tryptophan, so chicken, turkey, eggs, dairy. So tryptophan is an amino acid that helps produce melatonin and serotonin. Tools that will quiet the mind and nervous system before going to bed. You can do some journaling or, or do a journaling can also be a form of a brain dump, just getting your thoughts out so they're not spiraling in your head. Doing some gentle stretching or yoga using breath and movement to quiet your nervous system. Reading a book can also alter things in the brain, which will allow you to go to sleep. And doing some meditation. So it's important to create rituals and practices that calm the mind and the body in the evening. Um, it's a way of just giving your body and your mind a signal that it's time to get quiet. The mindfulness bedtime practices that have helped me as well is do some gratitude reflection. It kind of um, focuses your mind on, on positive things that have happened that day. Letting go of your day, kind of doing a body scan and just releasing any, any places where you're holding tension or letting go of conversations or interactions that day that maybe weren't supportive or positive or you know, we're heavy to take. So just kind of releasing and letting go of your day, doing a visualization with that. Practice postponing worry until the morning, what you can do. And I do this and the more I do it, the easier it actually becomes. I kind of envision a big bubble around me and I take my worries and I put them outside of my bedroom door, just mentally. And I say, okay, when I wake up in the morning, they'll still be there and I can take care of them then. This is my time for peace and quiet and rest. So it's it's a way of, of postponing worry, saying, okay, you know what? I'm going to pick you up in the morning, but I'm not going to do this now. And then like we talked earlier about doing a body scan or some deep breathing. So when you're going to sleep, you want to focus on just relaxing rather than on working and going to sleep. Just allow sleep to overcome you. Here's some reflection on sleep habits, and this is for you to take a note. Do I regularly get the amount of sleep that I need? What habits get in my way of getting quality sleep? What new behaviors could I adopt or change to support sleep and rest? And what help or support do I need to get better sleep? So this wraps up my presentation. Um, I just want to offer you my contact information. Um, as a coach, as a health coach, I offer personalized support to my clients in creating a new vision for health and wellness, for developing strategies make, for making positive change and empowering them to live a fulfilling and self-empowered life. I work with people one-on-one. -on -one. I do presentations like this. Um, I also do group coaching. And you can always schedule a free 20 minute discovery call if you're curious about coaching or getting support and you just want to get more information. There's never any pressure to move forward with me, but I'm here for your questions um, and if you'd like to know more. So thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, Katrine, for the wonderful presentation. I'll go ahead and uh, stop the recording and then we'll have uh, a little bit of a Q&A session. So let me stop this.